Greetings, men of 222. It's great to be with you today. And we're going to start a series on common men and uncommon stories. And oddly enough, the first person we're going to talk about is God. Now, since God is not a human being, you might ask yourself, why? And that would be a great question. I don't mean Jesus Christ, who was 100% human. I'm referring to the fact that I want to talk a little bit about how God reveals himself in two very well-known parables. And so we see the first one in Luke 15 that we're going to talk about today. And that's the story of the father of the prodigal son. Everybody calls it the prodigal son. But the fact is, the story is really about the father and God represents that father. So, what is the story of the father of the prodigal son? Before I get there, though, I want to talk a little bit about Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now, remember, in Luke 15, there are actually three parables. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And all of them together paint this wonderful picture of who God is and how he loves people, especially those who are lost, those who are sinners and are far away from him. So in the first one, it talks about the lost sheep. And it says, now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble. Why? Why should they grumble? Saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. You see, they were above eating with sinners. So he told them this parable saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on its shoulders, on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep, which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Isn't that a magnificent picture? That's Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now, it pictures God's love, and God's love is relentless. Yes, even reckless for the lost, for those who have not trusted Christ yet. And then the picture is that once Christ finds you, he puts you on his shoulders and he carries you. What a picture, isn't it? He left the 99 for you and me. He left the 99. Now, I didn't leave them unsafe. He left them in the open pasture. But he, he, because he was speaking to the Pharisees, I believe, by the way, that he was referring to 99 who need no repentance from their point of view. Arrogant, haughty people. You and I know, we know darn well, that those 99 people oftentimes need that same salvation that that one sinner does. When we're saved, there is immense joy isn't, in heaven. Isn't that great? Isn't it great that people get excited about a sinner who turns his life to Christ and away from, from being a bad person, one who falls short? Now, the second picture we get of God and what a model uh, he would be for us is in his story in Luke 15, 11 through 32, which is the story of the prodigal son. And prodigal means exceedingly or recklessly wasteful, exceedingly or recklessly wasteful. This young man just squandered everything. And in the story, the father, again, that's God, has two sons. And the younger son is restless and wants to strike out on his own. He's very immature and he wants his inheritance before his father dies. Now, the older son in Jewish law got a double portion in the inheritance. So this lad would have gotten a third of the estate, but he wanted to take it because he wanted 
what he wanted when he wanted it, right? So the younger son goes to a far country and he squanders his money. A famine causes him to work uh, for a swine farmer, pigs, disgusting for a fine Jewish boy because pork was absolutely a defiling meat in the Jewish tradition. So this lad comes to his senses and said to himself, my father's servants eat better than I do, so I'll go home and be a servant. I'm starving. I, oh my goodness. Can you imagine the despair? Here's this guy that has squandered an entire one third of the inheritance on easy living and, and just, and just getting bad advice and, and, and accepting it. And he's got to go home to his dad. Imagine how you would feel. You would think your father would rip your lips off. So when he comes home, his father is waiting for him. Waiting for him. And his dad throws a feast for him. He doesn't belittle him. He throws a feast for him. He gives him gifts to welcome him back. It shows God's love, even when we mess up. Now, the older son, like religious leaders, represents the father, resents the father's actions. He says, hey, look, I've been here the whole time, and I've done exactly what you asked me to do. I've been a good son, and you never once threw a party for me. Well... In this story, the father, as I said, represents God the Father. The younger son represents sinners, and the older son represents religious leaders. That is, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes of the time, those sorts of folks. So here you have this youngster who represents the Pharisees saying, Hey, you never threw us a party. And what takeaways then can we take from this story? First, the father allowed the son to exercise his free will and leave. See, he could have said, no, you can't have the inheritance, and he would have had a bitter lad on his hands. But what a terrible thing it must have been for him to give up to that boy, because he knew that that young fellow was immature. He knew what was going to happen. He recognized that. But he gave it up because... He wanted to allow the young person to leave. He allowed the sin to have consequence. One of the biggest mistakes that we make as parents, and I, I, I'm really guilty of this, but one of the biggest mistakes that we make as parents in this day and age is we just won't let our kids fail. We try to protect them so much that they never learn from failure. And the truth of the matter is, most of us in our most lucid moments would say, I learned far more from my failures than I did from my successes. And yet, by the same token, we won't let our own kids fail. This fellow did. This father said, I'll allow you to have the consequences of your sin. And by the way, he never once approved of the son's behavior. This is forgiveness. This is allowing the son back in, but it is not saying, I think what you did was right. Never once does he say that. We know the fathers treated other people well, consistently. Why? Because the lad says, my dad treats his servants better than I'm being treated. He witnessed that. And we also know that the father had taught his son the Bible. How do we know that? Well, when the kid came back, he said this, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice the son knew first and foremost that all sin is against God. I have sinned against heaven. Now, he did sin against his father as well. No question about that. But the first part of that was he sinned against God. But we see that the father accepted the son's repentance immediately. There was no conditional acceptance of that. The father gave the boy significant gifts that indicated the dad welcomed him home completely. The kid didn't have to say to himself, 
My dad let me back in the house, but I wonder how he really feels about me. He hugged his neck. He gave him gifts. He killed the fatted calf so they could have a feast. He said, welcome home, son. There was no, you are forgiven, but. Look at how God must feel over a lost soul. What does the picture show us? It says, for this son of mine, here's what the father said, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he's been found. And they began to celebrate. Describe the boy was dead. You and I are dead if we haven't trusted Christ as Savior. Yet we become alive when we turn to God for salvation. It's not just an exchange of life. It is breathing life into someone who is spiritually completely dead. When we accept now, I want to say this differently. You know, once you're born, you're going to live forever. You're alive forever. The only question is, will it be in heaven or will it be in hell? And this father was pleased that his son had repented, and so were the people in heaven who were joyous about it. Now, the father did treat the sons differently, didn't he? He loved the oldest son as much as he loved the youngest son, he came to the older son when the, when the guy was moping. The father, read the story. The father goes to him. He says, come inside and be involved in the feast. Why? Because the stronger always goes to the weaker. When someone is pouting about sin or something of that nature, the stronger person biblically always goes to the weaker, and that's what God the Father does here with that older son. He points out what the Father has has always been available to the older son. It, it wasn't a question, you know, sometimes we just don't think about throwing a feast, I guess, for the older son in this case, but the truth was everything he had, he would have given for that son just as much as for that younger son. I must admit, however, that this exchange helps me be aware that I need to encourage children or friends that I have that aren't prodigal. You know, it seems as if the only people that get attention are the ones who are messing up. Well, we need to make sure that those children that we have that aren't messing up know how much we love them. I hope I've done that with my boys. But it's just going to encourage me to call them this afternoon and tell them once again that I love them and I appreciate them for what they are. But don't miss that the older child was so focused on himself that his brother essentially returning from the dead was no big deal to him. This helps me remember that most of the time when I have problems with people, I need to keep in mind, this is my, there's a sign above my desk now that says, it's not about me. If I give you advice and you don't follow my advice, instead of getting bitter or frustrated with you because you didn't do what I thought was best, I, it's not about me, it's about you. I need to learn that about myself. If I could live this way, I would handle disappointment far better. Because this requires, to behave that way, requires a high level of humility. I have to be humble enough to recognize that it's not about me all the time. Now, fifth thing here is recognize that just because someone accuses you of something, as the older boy accused his father, it doesn't make it true. If you wrong me for something that I didn't do, that should be your issue, not mine. Proverbs 26.2 says, Like a sparrow when it's flitting, like a swallow when it's flying, so a curse without cause does not alight. A curse without cause 
when somebody says something ill of you without cause doesn't come to light on you. But the last thing is this. Most of all, learn that God loves you in a way that is relentless. When you're feeling, and by the way, not just if you've never been found. God loves you this way all the time. And he comes for you. And how and 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 there's a song that a man named Corey Asbury has written recently called Reckless Love. And listen to the words of this song because they so portray God's love for you and me. It says about God, it says, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down why you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Be intentional this week as you honor Jesus. See you next Saturday, Lord willing, and the creeks don't rise.